Ladies and gentlemen, Business Central enthusiasts, beer lovers, and anyone who loves a good time, welcome back to another exciting episode of A Shot of Business Central and a Beer. This is episode 61, and I'm your host, Ken Sabahar, here with my partner in crime, the man who knows Business Central better than he knows the sport of curling, Michael Introvertolo. How you doing today, Michael? <laughs> hey, Ken, doing great. Though I must admit, I know nothing about curling, so it's pretty easy to know more about Business Central. That being said, it's good to be back for another episode filled with BC brilliance and brews. Absolutely. We've got a packed show today. We'll be diving into the latest Business Central news. You know, the stuff that makes your heart race and your workflows smoother. And let's not forget, we're going to explore the powerful capabilities of multi-company setup. It's like having a master wizard by your side effortlessly uh, managing multiple entities without any hassle. Why am I picturing you wearing a pointy hat and purple robe with a wand managing my multiple companies for me? That's a little weird, but I'm not here to judge you. It's because I'm too sexy for my day-to-day -day clothing, Ken. <laughs> so hold on to your beer mugs because we've got some Microsoft AI chip news that's hotter than a jalapeno in a heat wave. Trust me, you do not want to miss out. Grab your glasses, everyone, because it's time for a shot of Business Central and a beer, where the BC features are always new, the news is always fresh, and the beer is always cold. Cheers for that, Ken. Let's get this show on the road. Cue the intro. All right, let's get this show kicked off with some beer drinking. Now, it's your your uh, your turn to bring in the beer. Always makes me a little bit nervous, I'm going to be honest with you. It probably should because I tend to like the higher alcohol stuff and you don't. So. But, but uh, you know, once again, I think we kind of have a little a first here. A little, should I call this a beer cocktail? You, what do you I guess it? you could call it a beer cocktail, right? Once you're mixing two things together, it becomes a cocktail, right? Yeah. So, so what do we have and what do we have in store right. for us? So today? I've always heard of the black and tan, right? Which is uh uh Guinness and something else. Other bass. Bass. Or a half and half, which is Guinness and Harp. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like 10 years ago, I was I was in the cigar barn and this guy was talking to me and he's like, You have to really try Barry Weiss and Guinness. And for 10 years, I'm like, I always want to try it. And you know, I've never had Guinness until this past holiday. So when it was my turn this month, I was like, ah. Uh, let me, let me look this up and see what we can do or mix some drinks or whatever. So it turns out that a lot of people are recommending getting a, a berry flavored beer and mixing it with like a, a chocolate stout. So I went and I got Four Hands Brewing Company chocolate milk stout beer to mix with Leinen Kugel's Berry Weiss. And Ken, surprisingly, has never had Berry Weiss. No, it's a little bit. And I just cheated, and I took a sip first of the Barry Weiss line of Kugels. And, um, yeah, it's very sweet. It's very, very berry. <laughs> Say it four times. Very berry. Very berry. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's, get... it's not a high alcohol, right? 4.7% alcohol volume. And it's uh, it poor. It's very, like, what, what, what color would you call that? Peach? Yeah, like a dark peach, right? Yeah. It's not it's a, not it a... definitely has a oh, hint could... of pink. Yeah, it has a little bit of a berry red tone to a regular beer. Yeah. So that goes first, right? Yeah. We do the we do the berry weiss first. And then we I have take, take a sip of the a four hands brewing company chocolate milk stout. Yeah. Uh St. Louis, Missouri, five point five percent alcohol. So not yeah, terribly not, strong. Not too bad. Definitely I, smells chocolatey. Yeah, absolutely. You got to give it a sip first or no? I'll give you that. Oh, definitely has some chocolate tones. Yep, that's Under. chocolate stout. Now, I'm not sure how we got to pour it. Probably pour it like on an angle to keep the to keep Maybe. the chocolate stout on the top. That's kind of our goal, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess they don't mix or they're not supposed to mix. Well, we're going to find out. I mean, you can only pour on an angle for so long, right? Right. Yeah. Actually, 
Yeah, it kind of did. It kind of did mix. I can still see a little yeah, bit mixed. of the a little <laughs> bit of the lighter color at the bottom and a little bit darker at the top. But for the most part, it kind of looks like it's. Uh, yeah, it's not like vinegar and oil, right? Where it's completely separate. No, or it, traditional black and tan, like you said, where the Guinness sits on top and the harp or the bass sits on the bottom. I wonder if that's something to do with the Guinness, the way it's made, the, or whatever, to where it, it viscosity yeah, of it or yeah. something. Yeah. I, I'm more excited though that it did mix because now it's a whole different flavor. Yeah. Right. Berry and chocolate, right? All right. Let's go for it. Yeah. Berry and chocolate. Yeah. It's like Valentine's Day over here. It is. This is this is what I would call a dessert beer. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? It's yeah, it's like a it's like a chocolate covered raspberry. Yeah, like, very. I, that, that the berry flavor is very raspberry, right? It the smell has, too has a lot of raspberry flavor to it, or smell, taste. So different. Yeah, Definitely beer, different. beer cocktail. We'll see. I, mean, I guess. Uh, yeah, usually we have a kind of thing like, okay, are well, you going to go back for a second one? But but we kind of <laughs> have two beers got, yeah. here already at once. I guess the question is going to be: Are you going to mix it again, or are you going to pick a separate next time? That's the question. All right, let's see here. I want to talk anything else about uh, what we got? It's got a 90 score. The chocolate milk stout, milk stout does from Four Hands Brewing on Beer Advocate, which is uh, pretty good. But then again, that's a purely brass beer, so it's always going to get uh, yeah, yeah. And the line beer. line and Kugels again. We I think we years ago, several years ago, we did have a line and Kugel summer shandy. Yeah, and you might have tried one of the other you brought it, yeah, flavors you brought it like as well. It's like a variety whatever, pack. Yeah. Um, I like the summer shandy. Were they the cherry beer? The lemon is yeah, the cherry. Oh, yeah. God, no. <laughs> the lemon was good, though, right? The summer shandy yeah, good, yeah. lemon is not as sweet. I think that's the di- that's the key difference, right? There's still a strong lemony flavor in the summer shandy, but it's the the lemon lemon flavor isn't sweet. Yeah, naturally it's more right, more sour kind of. So I think that less sweetness makes that a lot more appealing. Tastes a lot better for me at least. The, these are very sweet. Yeah. Like the, so me when I drink a line of Google Berry Weiss, it reminds me of they were really popular for some reason at you've heard of the bar Fox and Hound when when I was in my early twenties they they had it on tap and everybody for some reason seemed to drink. You you could have your own mug you kept there and everything. Oh wow. Yeah. So that's what it reminds me of. So I, I've had it before. Um, that was the early the early days of the craft beer cycle, yeah, yeah right early, like early that was kind of yeah. really strikingly different at that time oh yeah compared absolutely. to what else was available right yeah everything on tap was just normal beer but it's good i mean i i'll tell you what though it, it's one of the rare beers which we've encountered a couple but not too many where it tastes just how it's supposed to taste, right? Berry Weiss. Yeah, you get a berry flavor. Yeah, there's there wasn't a lot of surprise right. when I took the first sip. So, yep. So I'm I'm just happy to be sitting here with you having a beer, and we're about to talk some business central. So next we're gonna start off with some news. We're then gonna dive into multi-company setup. This is always a really complex comp it can be a very complex discussion because there's different ways like a lot of other things in business central there's multiple ways to accomplish right the same thing and there's pros and cons based on which way you go so it's really important that you understand what are the options what are the pros and the cons of those options and that's what we're going to be trying to go through uh in a podcast format here um, for everyone and talking about a new multi-company feature right as well as right version 24 2024 wave one that's coming out come out in april has a new set of functionality and that's kind of yeah exactly why we're talking about this topic this month is because of this new functionality that's coming out people need to be aware because it adds a whole nother wrinkle into the dimension. multi-company uh, uh, <laughs> setup, yeah, whole new dimension. <laughs> Play on words. Play on words. Yep. <laughs> yep. And then yeah, and then you've got some fun AI topics for us to close it out with, and some some delicious snacks here that I see. So uh, let's get let's get started with some news. All right, I'm going to be honest with you, Michael. All things considered. 
I'd rather be drinking a shot of whiskey right now, <laughs> but let's talk shot of Business Central and let's talk some it. news. Let's do it. So um, we sit at the very end, tail end of May, early June, um, 2024, wave one, the official April release for Business Central has been deployed to some environments. It has not yet been deployed to all Business Central online environments. Which is kind of shocking, right? Because we're two months out. Um, I've, I've gotten the emails where it says, you know, we're pausing, we're restarting. I think I've gotten about three of those over the past couple of months with, which is, to me, says what? There was a problem with something. There, Yeah, there were some reported issues. Um, I believe one area in the particular, in the area of bank deposits, um, but I think there was a couple other issues where they started updating and found some issues. So they paused the updates. Um, in the in one of the environments I just looked at here are kind of our Cronus environment. It says that June 4th uh, updates to from 23.5 to 24.0 will resume. So you can schedule it there. So some people may be on 24. Some people may be soon be on 24.1, actually. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely a big problem, especially like especially partners who use um, the Microsoft CDX platform to demo Business Central. I went in there the other day just to create or to access my demo environment, and I couldn't access my demo environment. I couldn't create a new demo environment, you know. So, I mean, it it, it could potentially be affecting partners. Yeah, a lot. So, so if you're if you're uh, you're running you're running Business Central online and you're you're not yet seeing those new those sexy new Copilot features that are coming out with you know 2024 release of wave one, uh, just know that um, it's coming. They're coming, uh, but you may not be there yet. So just uh, patience in the next couple of weeks. Uh, hopefully that will all be behind us and you'll be on version 24. Speaking of version 2024, let's talk about release wave two. Woo. Microsoft has released the investment areas for uh, Business Central for the 2024 release wave two. And uh, well, let's talk, let's just let me mention a couple here. So for finance, they're going to be investing in collections improvements and regulatory requirements. Um, for supply chain, project and service optimizations, as well as field service integration with service management. Now, moving over, it's funny because the two biggest areas where they, it seems like Microsoft is putting their money is in AI, which is kind of a given. What? No. no. Shocking, right? No. <laughs> the second part, though, the second one is reporting. So they're still high and, and mighty on reporting. I mean, I know it's... It's it's popular. You can but. never satisfy an end user's demand for more reporting options, right? It, Which coming from an accountant or somebody who's a CPA. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that's why you're doing it all, right? You yeah. you've got all this data sitting there, and you want more and more ways to slice and dice and analyze that data. Yeah. So I love it. All right. Well, to me, it's boring. So let's talk about the sexy <laughs> AI part. <laughs> Here's some of the things that Microsoft's going to be investing in in, in AI. And the, the first thing I'm going to mention to me is, to me, going to set the bar for all future AI uh, improvements and features, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So you are going to be able to go into the Copilot chat in Business Central and create orders right from the chat. So I'm assuming that where you can say, Cop <laughs> say that again. Just say that. Let's repeat that again. Say, say that again. you're going to be great to orders from chat. So let's break it down that way. Okay. <laughs> I wish everybody could see the look on Ken's face right now where it's BS. <laughs> yeah. But if that works, where you can go into the Copilot chat and create an order, just tell it to create an order. If that works and they get that figured out, they have set the bar for future AI improvements in Business Central. And and the sky is the limit. Then <laughs> I wish everybody could see Ken's face right now. I mean, he's the, looking at me the, like stop. Well, and, and and if you well, if 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 that's true, and you incorporate the dictation capabilities, the keyboard becomes significantly less important. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Tablets are the future, right? So, but that's I think that's. If if they get that right, that that sets the bar. Some other things they're going to be 
adding money into with AI is page summarization. Okay, that's really is that AI? I don't know. Um, payment reconciliation, uh, e documents, more matching, drag and drop on prompt dialogue, late payment prediction. There's going to be a new model. There's going to be third party knowledge bases, and uh, there's going to be more languages with AI. So I guess maybe. Well, we'll talk more about it in, a, in the AI segment, but Microsoft has seemingly developed a way to use AI to translate um, languages in real time. And then also, so they say all those and more to come. So, all right. is it possible to create orders from chat? Is it central? Um, I think it's anything's possible. Um, I, the, the, the question is there, there's just so many pieces of information that you need to record on an order that, that well, what's the know. benefit? I mean, you, you have to tell it a customer, a ship to address location, a purchase order number, the items and quantities that are on the order, uh, right? Um, do you, a shipping method, there, there's all of that information is typically data that's input or right defaulted in and confirmed by a user during an order entry process. So the, the, the question is, I mean, do I have to type all that in, right? Or, or say all of that, I guess, into the chat. So the, yeah, you know, again, it's, I'm sure there are scenarios and, and for certain, um, you know, uh, Users who may need those types of aids uh, to help with certain tasks. Oh, huge, absolutely. Right, a visually impaired yeah. person, for example. Uh, that the, 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 these are, you know, opening doors that didn't exist. So, so it's it's great. Uh, but, but you know, in the, you ju you just kind of got to see it in action and find those use cases potentially. Yeah. So, so some of the other things, real quick, that they're going to be investing in is geographic expansion, user experience. Uh, obviously, sharing more error details with Power Automate, actionable permissions, errors, stuff like that. They're going to invest in more Power Platform. And let's see what else here. Administration, um, flexible update management, and a comprehensive admin center app management. So that'll be interesting. But, you know, all in all, not bad. It's going to give us a little preview of what's coming. So pretty good. You know, like drinking through a fire hose. <laughs> right? So you just keep hey. coming. Yeah, hose water is the best water ever. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah, you're the the uh, choco berry cocktail is uh, going down pretty smoothly, yeah, Michael. I like it. So like far, it. so good. So, um, I understand you possibly may have recently been in Bangkok, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, in the meantime, uh, in mid May, I made a trip to Denver, Colorado for the Dynamics Con Live user conference. Held, some, held a session or two too, right? I did, yeah. yep, yep. I, I led two sessions. One was on uh, called a cornucopia of reporting options where we talked about all of the myriad of different ways that you can extract data and information out of Business Central, uh, including all the new OData, you know, Excel and Power BI functionality. Uh, and the other one was on the new field monitoring tool, comparing it and contrasting it to the legacy change log product, where we talked about kind of similarities, differences, and how they work together. Are they recorded? Uh, those sessions, uh, my, these sessions were not recorded. Okay. Uh, they may have recorded some sessions at the conference, uh, but I, I don't think so. I, I don't think I saw much of that going on. Um, but it was a good group. It was a good crowd. Um those con the conf dynamics con conference always do a really good job. Uh, last month we had Molly Fuchsia yep. on uh, from Dynamics Con or Dynamics User Group. Yeah, love her, she's the best. Uh, she is great, and um, the the conference was very well done. I think it roughly doubled in size. Mm -hmm. I would say from the prior year, wow. and last year it had doubled from the prior year. So, um, I, you know, it's a growing conference. My guess is next year in May. It will be held in Chicago, so uh, convenient for us. But um, I don't know. Hopefully, people are looking forward to uh, coming someplace new. I, I, you know, I've I've been going to Dynamics user conferences and partner conferences for years, and uh, it, I can't. I don't even recall any in Chicago. 
any major user user conferences or user groups that were held in hosted in Chicago. So uh, that's that's next May. It's going to be in Chicago. I would expect over two thousand people. Really, next year as my oh, guess. Big city, yeah. You know, just the, the the at the pace the conference is growing, yeah. the success of it. I thought the sessions, the content sessions that I saw was really good. A um, lot of ISVs, you know, showing up as well. So if I remember um, too. You you talked about you really liked maybe if it was in Texas or something the year before I can't remember the like meet and greet that they, they used to host or whatever where it was like a a common area. Did they do that this again this year? I think well, it was outside for the first one. Well, at, uh, last year it was in Scottsdale, Arizona, oh, oh. at the Scottsdale Plaza Resort uh, and Hotel, which was beautiful. Yeah, and a lot of the the, the receptions were outdoors. It was it was gorgeous. Oh. A little warm for some people, I'm sure. sure. Um, this was at the Denver uh, Tech Center area, which is kind of an area maybe a, several miles from downtown Denver uh, with, with just a ton of technology companies kind of organized and a bunch of, you know, a lot of big buildings uh, nice. kind of out, out in the area. So, so yeah, that was my trip to Denver. Unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to do any hiking uh, really or anything fun. Uh, did my, have my de- nephew drove me around a little bit, met up with him for dinner yeah. and he kind of just drove me around and showed me some areas. But, but uh, I know that other people there, Couple, couple, a uh, couple of our friends from Expand It were there and did some hiking, and some other people that I talked to really got to enjoy it a lot more uh, than we did. But uh, always hard at those conferences, right? Because everything's kind of jam packed. Yeah, and you really got you got to go out of your way to, to 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 travel a few days early. Yeah, or stay a few days late, and uh, that's always something I, I always struggle with. Uh, you know, <laughs> committing committing to staying an extra day or two days right, right. just just for my own personal enjoyment <laughs> so uh yeah bangkok michael yeah so uh is that the capital of thailand by the way <laughs> um so recently directions asia was held at uh was held in bangkok and uh it was from may 16th to may 17th um mike morton was there as long as uh, some other people from from microsoft um Nothing, nothing too out of the ordinary. I, I didn't see any like breaking news from from Directions Asia, but you know we want to mention and give a shout out to uh, people in the Asia, people from the Asian community that are in Asia. We have a, a big following out there, so yeah. We hope you all have fun. We're we're global. We are, we are global. I think what ninety countries, ninety. Whether we like it or not, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a reality, and uh, we love it. We love all of our listeners from from all over the world. So. Uh, yeah, I just hope with the way I talk when it gets translated that <laughs> <laughs> it's not too bad. Yeah. All okay. Right. All right. Uh, so uh, I wanted to kind of talk about this is probably more so for the partners uh, than it is for end users, but indirectly impacting end users as well. Uh, for for several years now, Microsoft has offered uh, kind of a support plan for partners. And there's different levels that you could be on. Uh, And one of the very popular levels that a lot of partners sit at, I believe, is what's called advanced support for partners. Uh, It's kind of a low, I think, a lot pretty common uh, for for mid mid to large size partners. Um, And then there's another level called premier support for partners. And my understanding is that Microsoft is making changes uh, to the advanced support for partners program. Uh, you, you can renew under that program for another year, but you will have reduced benefits by being under that plan. You may or may not be offered an opportunity to move to a premier support for partners plan. Mm-hmm. So I, I think depending on maybe your size and volume, uh, you, you, you may just um, not no longer have access to your advanced support for partners plan at, going into ne- the next fiscal year, which starts July 1st yeah. at Microsoft. Um, or you may have to pony up some more dollars uh, to uh, participate Sig- in the premier support. Significant amount of more money, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it may be a decision that partners are going to have to make. What we're still evaluating ourselves is what is the, what are what is the price point? What are the level of benefits? What are the ramifications if we do or don't move to the premier support for partners? How good uh, is either way, point? right? And and so, you know, we we are personally we're still evaluating kind of that decision. Uh, but but that's something that that may impact partners' ability to receive support from Microsoft. So that's why I think it's important for end users who may be listening, is that your partner may or may not going forward have the same level of support from Microsoft that they're used to. Right. And so that d- could indirectly impact your business. Yeah, especially if yeah your partners. Um, doesn't have the support capabilities that some partners do. Right. Right. All right. All right. So speaking of support and, and, and business central and all that stuff, Ken, did you know that the business central developer certification MB-820 is now available? I did. And I know that we've got at least one developer who's already passed it. Right. But did you know that if you pass the associated MB-800 and the MB-820 exams, you'll meet your advanced skilling criteria for solution partner designation. I did not know that. There you go. Yeah. That is some breaking, I don't know about breaking news, but some good news, let's say. So that's something for partners to keep in mind. Um, let's see what else. I got only one more little bit of uh, information. Are you? I'm, I'm good. <clears throat> All right. So my next bit of information is there are new built-in Power BI reports for Business Central. And I want to read to you from Microsoft what it's about. It says, in October 2024, the Microsoft product team behind Dynamics 365 Business Central is introducing a new feature that includes built-in Power BI reports for several key areas, finance, sales, purchase, inventory, projects, and manufacturing. So from May 2024 to October 2024, Microsoft is actively seeking Business Central online customers who are interested in trying out these new reports in their environments. Uh, the reports are fully functional and supported um, during the private preview phase. Uh, Microsoft is particularly interested in gathering feedback on various aspects, including uh, industry-specific usage, multi-language capabilities, and, and data sizes. So what we'll do is, is if uh, we'll include a link to sign up for this. Uh, um, Business Central Power BI new report preview. We'll include a link in the show notes if you want to uh, give it a shot. But more Power BI reports being embedded in BC. You can't go wrong. Love it. All right. All right, next up, we're going to try to uh, – you got something else for now? You good? No. Dive right. in, ready to dive into multi-company. We're going to try to dive into, uh, yeah, multi-company and, and keep it um, – digestible i guess for for a podcast we'll right? do our it's, best it could be complicated so stick around revolutionize your business communications with microsoft teams phone from solution systems and save up to 50 percent on phone bills contact solution systems today all right we're back for our featured segment and today we're going to be talking about um, shared master data, which is a, a new feature of, of Business Central. And it really helps with the whole uh, multi-company aspect of, of, of Business Central. You know, there's different different ways you can have single company, traditional multi-company. Now you can have the shared master data company, as well as what Ken likes to refer to as the single company, multi-company um, <laughs> situation. So, Without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Ken, and Ken's going to try to explain this as eloquently as he could because I would screw this all up on a podcast. So, yeah, let's let's go. So, so yeah, master data management is this new feature that's coming out in uh, 2024, Wave One, version 24, uh, out officially in April, <laughs> as we should be, as we yeah. just talked about. Um, and this new feature is, and I'm, I'm kind of just reading here a little bit, just very briefly from the Microsoft Learn uh, function. It's available online. Um, so it's uh, basically this feature is intended for scenarios where you want to move the setup data from one company to another company in the same environment. 
Uh, and it's built uh, as a data synchronization engine that lets you keep the data between those companies synchronized after the initial move. So the scenario, right, we're going to talk about a couple scenarios here where this would be useful, right? Okay. This is obviously it's a multi-company scenario. So you have one business central environment that you're operating in, like your one production environment, and you have multiple companies in there. So this is a new feature that that gives, I think it the, the overall, it gives organizations another option for hand, manage, setting up and managing their multiple companies together is really what it does. There's always been multiple options available and how you do it. This, this I think, adds kind of a, a, a new, nice new feature in actually creating a new option for people. So, so what, are, what we're going to try to do here is talk about, we kind of have four scenarios um, that we kind of want to talk about. Um, and then we're, what, we're, what we'll do is um, sticking with our tradition here on a shot of Business Central and a beer, we are going to use the Cronus Brewery organization as an example to kind of talk about the scenarios and in which scenarios each multi-company setup might fit or or be or be best for. Sounds good to me. Right. Anytime we can inject more beer into the conversation. So let's let's start with um, let's start with the simplest scenario. Right. And just this is more more of a baseline scenario. Um, a single company, right? One legal entity. And what's key here, when I say one legal entity, this is an organization or entity that requires its own balance sheet, its own self-balancing trial balance, right? Okay. So, so that's when we say legal entity, it's something that you're going to produce a balance sheet for. That company may have may have to file its own tax returns, right? Pay income tax based on that legal entity. So we're going to start. The baseline scenario is going to be single company, and we're just going to call this the Cronus Brewery, where we have a single legal entity that brews beer at three locations. There's three breweries, um, maybe. You know, one in California, one in Chicago, and one in Florida. Now, if it were overseas or anything, would it have any sort of impact on on this? Yep, great question. It could because that other country may have a separate set of of localizations. So, if in the UK, for example, or Switzerland, um, they they may be operating in their own separate environment because their environment has those Swiss or UK localizations built in. So in that case, they're gonna be in a completely separate environment. This multiple shared One. company shared data, not, not applicable. Gotcha. They're gonna be kind of on their own standalone. So, so yeah, so I'm picking a, a yeah, within one country or localization, uh, you've got one legal entity, three locations. That's pretty simple. It's one, business central production environment with one company in it. And you could still use dimensions uh, to track sales or activity by location, by territory, department, cost center, whatever dimensions you typically might use. But but you cannot produce a, a balance sheet by dimension. Just one of the key takeaways, standard business central, uh, yeah, is is dimensions aren't uh, for producing right. company balance sheet results. So, so that this option is fairly common. Would you say yeah. or not? Very common. Probably one of the most common scenarios is um, that it's just yeah, you're operating one legal entity in Business Central. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, the second scenario is a what I'll call a traditional multi-company scenario. So we have some common ownership, right? Some, some owner who owns multiple legal entities. 
And in this example, we will say that company one is a brewery, right? They're, they're making beer, bottling it. Company two is a separate company that purchases that beer from the brewery and distributes it to retail outlets. Okay. Right. Separate, separate company though. Yeah, and maybe they, maybe that distribution company also distributes other products, right? So they're distributing the breweries, Cronus Breweries beer, but maybe they also do snacks or other, other beverages or whatever. So completely different business. Basically. Totally different business. Gotcha. And then there's a third company that's a pub. So they, it's a bar restaurant type scenario right and 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 uh, obviously they're buying some beer from the distribution company because they serve the cronus beer mm -hmm. at at their pub but I mean, then they've got all this other stuff right point yeah. of sale system and but another and, completely different business completely different run by different people managing everything independently okay right so imagine in this scenario you're going to have three different right uh, groups of people managing each of these three companies. And there, there could even be a fourth company, which is like a real estate holding company um, that has a very simple chart of accounts with a few transactions in it. That's your traditional multi-company scenario. And the key thing about this one is that all of the data in each of those companies is completely independent of the data for, in the other companies. So, the brewery has its own list of customers and vendors and items because it has to buy yeast mm -hmm. and grains and sugar and things like that to make the beer, right? Bottles and caps and yeah. things like that. Um, the distribution company has its own customers. It has its own vendors. Its items are the bottles and kegs of beer that it's purchasing from Cronus mm -hmm. Brewery. Right. So they have no need, though, to share any. Data no, completely like separate chart of accounts, completely separate items, customers, vendors, transactions, and even, of course, the pub. Right. Right. Yet again, a completely separate chart of accounts and everything. Now, in this in this traditional environment, right, all of the data, the setup data and the transactions are all independent. You could set up a fifth consolidation company where you map all of those GL chart of accounts to a common consolidated chart of accounts and you combine the, the general ledger activity to produce a rolled up financial statement. What was the total income of all these entities together mm -hmm. so that you can present it in a single view? So that's the traditional, what's always been there. Many of our customers run the scenarios gotcha. where they have these companies. They may or may not do the consolidation, right? You, you could argue that in this case, I don't really even care to see a consolidated financial statement with the real estate company and the brewery and the right. pub all combined. I just want to look at them maybe independently. So what's new in 2024 wave one is this new shared master data management functionality. Now, what this allows you to do is when you initially set up Business Central, you can flag certain tables as shared data and then define which companies that data should be shared and synchronized with. The common example here is maybe a franchise type scenario. So yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking was <clears throat> a franchise scenario. But my question is, and maybe you don't know the answer. So this seems to fit perfectly for a franchise scenario. What, what, are, what are they doing now? or before this was available, which did they just use a traditional multi-company layout or, or do they have to? Yep. So, so I think what, what people may have, what, what you probably had to do if you had it, like, let's say, so what, what do we talk? First of all, let's clarify when we say franchise model, what we're really saying is that like the, McDonald's, we could have, we could have one business central environment set up with 50 different companies running in it. And each company is a completely independently owned entity. So they need their own balance sheet. They need their data to be segregated from other people's data. Um, but there's some commonality. We want every franchise to use the same chart of accounts, mm -hmm. have the same dimensions, the same posting groups, 
maybe even the same list of vendors to start with or or the same vendors or the same items because they're all going to sell the same items right. you know jimmy john sandwich shop don't they all sell the same items yep. right um so that's what this new feature allows you to do is flag that gl accounts dimensions vendors items posting groups payment terms codes payment methods you define that list of tables that are shared or common and then you the system will always keep all of the companies in sync when you add a new vendor to your main company whichever company you've identified as your your main company it will automatically synchronize that data out to all the other companies so what are they doing now though? today they would have to create a uh a company let's, let's call it template company oh gotcha and someone manually has to go in there. They still would have to update that. And then on day one, if a new franchise starts, they would take that copy and, and use that to build the new company. Wow. So at that point in time, they're going to have all of those new ones. But if a new vendor gets created, you've already got 50 mm -hmm. companies those new companies out of the box would not automatically right. have that new vendor added to their environment. And that could be a big problem. Yeah. So what do they do? If you, if they want that, they would have, that would have to be custom functionality to say, Hey, when I'm in company template and I add a new vendor, automatically go add this vendor record to every company mm -hmm. out there. So it could be done. It could be done through customizations, like a custom extension. Yeah. This now adds this as standard functionality in Microsoft. It's pretty nice. Out of the box. I like it. Yep. Especially, right, if you're a franchisee or a franchise. Yep. I'm sure it's applicable to other businesses as well. Right. Yeah. I think franchises, this, it kind of makes, it's the easiest example. In our example, of course, we have a chain of pubs, right? right. The Cronus, the Cronus pub. And there's 20 locations that they open Cronus pubs at, right? You would want each one of those pubs to have the same chart of accounts, vendors, setups, Everything. so that data can is common and easily understandable across all these. Now, would it be difficult? Um, like, let's just say, for for example, McDonald's, right? It's a franchise, but McDonald's sell different products locally compared to. So, yep. would they be able to utilize this even with that, or or would they not be a candidate? I, I don't think so because like if you're saying like the Mc, the McRib is being sold in the Chicago area, but right. it's not maybe available in the New York area right right, right. now. Um, if it, and that's a new product that didn't exist. Yeah. Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. To be way. use the feature, you would just you would have to add the McRib into your into your master company. Right. And then it would be it would be visible in both the New York and Chicago locations. Now, New York may not be selling it. They not be, may not be using it or recording sales or whatever, yeah. but it still could be in their item list. I don't, I, so that wouldn't of, necessarily gotcha. hurt anything. Um, but if, I think to answer your question, if you wanted Chicago to have the McRib sandwich on their item list, but New York does not, I think that would not then be, you could not synchronize the, that data. Gotcha. In some like where the McRib is not synchronized to all locations, but right. uh, the McFlurry Oreo McFlurry is yeah. on an I, right item by item basis. You can you can choose which companies you want to share the master data with, and you don't have to share the master data with every company. But then those companies would have to manually add their own items. In gotcha. this example, right? So. Table by table, company by company, it's a all or nothing yeah. proposition. And I, I would assume eventually you might even be able to build extensions or something to to do something somewhere along. You the could. My my argument for for your question and scenario would be, you would use the master data feature. You'd add the McRib, and it would be visible in all companies. Right. They they just have to. It's going to yeah. be in their data. Tough crap. Yeah, not a big deal. Right. <laughs> right. So, so that's the third scenario. Last scenario, people are like, what? <laughs> um, the last scenario. So 
in all of these scenarios that we've talked about so far, or actually the last two, right? The, the traditional multi-company and the new shared master data scenario, all of the transactions, the ledger entries and the posted documents are all still existing in each individual company. So that means that to get to, to run, a, if you wanted to see a list of all the sales invoices across all the organizations, you would actually have to pull data from three separate companies and then combine it together in a Power BI data set or something, right? Um, or, uh, yeah, so, so, so you have kind of three separate databases, if you will, or companies within that environment. The last scenario is where... You say, yes, we have shared master data, but we also have shared corporate services or HQ headquarters mm -hmm. services where, yeah, I have I have 10 companies, but those companies and I, I they they record their transactions in, the, in each of their companies. But we have a shared services is what most people refer to this as where corporate is managing all of the accounts payable processing, accounts receivable processing, maybe fixed assets, financial reporting. And so there's, there's activity potentially across multiple companies. Corporate's cutting a check to pay some vendors where invo the first invoice is for company one, the second invoice is for company four, and the third invoice is for company nine, right? But they want to cut one check. And you're like, how do you do that, Ken? <clears throat> what do you got? Be difficult, right? Well, it would be difficult with standard Business Central out of the box. Right. However, there are apps available for this. So one that's relatively common, uh, people may have heard about this one, is an app called Multi-Entity Management by a partner called Binary Stream. And what they've added is functionality that allows you to use global dimension one as an entity code. And then it automatically builds do to and do from entries so that you can operate all of these legal entities inside of one business central company. And, and these do to do from entries make sure that each company's trial balance stays balanced to zero. Sounds automatically nice. yeah right sounds really nice so yeah it's it's a great feature and the, the again these are the scenarios where there's a corporate headquarters that's managing doing like shared services for mm -hmm. payables receivables bank management yeah. like they have one bank account at the corporate headquarters and they're processing cash payments from customers across all 10 companies right so so that does require um an app so um, these four scenarios pretty much cover any option or any scenario that would present itself right for from a business standpoint there's really nothing being left out here correct yeah the 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 only the only scenario i think we're leaving out which you touched on earlier is international oh. so that there's a there's a legal entity right. that's in spain or uh thailand or somewhere right but most likely they have their own they're going to have their own instance their own tenant they're going to have their own independent data now what they would have to do if you're going to consolidate they would have to export their consolidation data file and then you would have to import that file into the consolidation company gotcha. in the u.s let's say if you're based in the u.s yeah. right so so you still can consolidate gl data up to a to a parent level um, but, have the consolidation. but in terms of shared data management, where certain master data is shared across the companies, I do not believe you can share the data across tenants. Not yet. Not I yet. may be speaking out of school <laughs> on this and maybe next month we'll have to clarify that, that you can indeed set it up to, sh to share data across a tenant. Yeah or to a different environment, but I, I don't believe that's there today. So it's just, uh, let's something put this, to to something out. to check out. Yeah, absolutely. If you have that scenario, you should check it out. But what I think this, you know, with the, again, what this new feature does is it really gives companies more options, Yeah. right? The ability to, to be operate more efficiently, yet with the independence that you need in terms of keeping transactional data separate into separate companies. 
Um, so it's 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 a great feature. I'm kind of working on putting together some diagrams to show what what does this look like. I know that you know we yeah. said we're doing this on a podcast, right? And it's kind of tricky. Um, but but I think when you see a picture yeah. of these four scenarios, it makes it makes it a lot more easier to understand uh, what we're talking about here. Yeah, but all in all, I mean, you like you like the new shared master data uh, feature. I, I think it's it's really nice. I think it's I do. Applicable. Yeah, it's something that we've been we I know a lot of businesses look for. And honestly, there's been instances, I believe, in the past where companies have asked for this type of thing. And, and is, if we're like, now oh, we don't have that capability, they may just move on to look at other ERP systems. Yeah. Was this ever available in the old NAV? Nope. Nope. Not, not delivered by Microsoft yeah, as a standard right. feature. No. Fair enough. So, so, yeah, there's a lot there. Um, but, you know, it is something that comes up often in, in a lot of scenarios a lot of businesses do have separate legal entities that they need to they they want to keep them separate but yet they also <laughs> want to not have to set up something twice right and manage two different of systems so i think this gives you one more option to have your cake and eat it too <laughs> so but um but yeah it's coming out it's it's in this part of this new release and i i think unfortunately it is something that maybe does need to be something that you start with at the yeah. beginning. You can't like if you go, over oh, we're it. already up and running and we've got three companies. How do we start using this? Yeah. Not sure yet. Haven't kind of gotten that far down the road. Um, maybe, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what that holds. But. Yeah, we'll just let AI take care of it in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Give it. <laughs> All right. Well, I think you did a great job explaining it. So. Um, we got a little whiteboard here. I'll include the picture of the whiteboard in the uh, in the show notes that you, can, you guys can see some of Ken's drawings as well. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck reading it. <clears throat> well, let's see. What do we got left? We're coming up. We got some I'm AI ready. snack. Time. I'm ready for a snack. Yeah. We'll talk about the latest happenings with AI and stuff like that with Microsoft. So kick back, everybody. <laughs> All right, we're back for AI snack time, and uh, we're sitting here enjoying our black and berry beer while also enjoying an assortment of crackers with a four cheese tray. So we got some different cheeses to go along it's with. It's delicious. Crackers. I've been snacking all along. <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fess up. Yeah, as have I. All right, so let's jump on into AI snack time. We've got a couple little updates here from, from Microsoft. Uh, before we jump in, I want to talk about a buzzword. Uh, so a buzzword to keep an eye on is the edge. Formerly, you know, it used to be referred to as the intelligent edge. And I think of that one movie with, um, um, oh God, I can't remember the name of the movie or the character, Jason something. Or he's born? No, no, not Jason Sudeikis. He used to be on Saturday Night Live, I think. The comedy where uh, Russell, Russell Brand's in it with him. Anyway, he, he screams out. Somebody says something about the cloud and he says, Nobody knows what the cloud is, <laughs> you know. So I think that's how people feel about the intelligent edge. That's how I used to feel. What is the intelligent edge? You know what I mean? Um, but a lot of people now are starting to use just the edge as opposed to the intelligent edge. And edge computing allows devices basically in uh, remote locations to process data at the edge of the network. So with AI, instead of processing it on like Microsoft server, the edge would at the edge of the network would be your computer. And the AI chip and everything will be in your computer and you could still do have the AI functionality while not being connected to um, the Internet. So. Speaking of Microsoft computers, let's jump in. Microsoft has unveiled a new Copilot Plus PCs featuring advanced AI capabilities. I consider myself half marketing guy, half tech geek. I love this stuff. <laughs> so. It is a new advanced AI processor that is able to compute 40 plus trillion operations per second. 40 plus trillion per second. Blows my mind. Well, I don't I don't think anyone can kind of visualize what 40 trillion it. plus looks per like. Per second. Yeah. How much that is per second. Yeah. I mean, how much I don't even know how much data is in the available on the entire internet. I mean, could you go through 40 plus trillion things on the internet? I have no idea. Have I drinking 40 trillion beers in my lifetime? 
I have to sit down and think about that one. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> so it also has recall, which is uh, basically photographic memory. The device can log all user activities from the web browsing to voice chats, and it stores this data locally. You can turn it on, you can turn it off. Um, but so, for example, I use this this uh, this example a lot. You can ask Copilot to search through your pictures and locate a brown purse. And the AI will go through all of your pictures on your computer and find each picture that has a brown purse. So to me, you're really getting into AI functionality there where AI is not just processing information, it's recognizing things. Um, so what's the, ma the magic is that these PCs now are outfitted with these high performance chips and software capabilities because of those high performance chips that they can now accomplish all these things locally? Yeah, and it's not just searching and doing things based on keyword search, right? It's it's based on like semantic search where there's logic behind it. So I think I think that's a step up. Um, you know, there's there's so many things you can do. I, I saw a video where people were speaking to somebody in a different country and it was translating what they say in real time into whatever language you wanted, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Um another one was the father was in joined this game of Minecraft and said, hey, my son plays Minecraft. And he's having a one-on-one -on -one speech with the AI in its natural language. And it sounds like you're talking to somebody sitting right next to you. But AI was able to go into this program and then they say they can go into other programs as well. I'm assuming all programs that didn't, didn't have any limitations to it. And AI can actually recognize what's in the program. So you could say, hey, I think he used something like, hey, uh, I need to learn how to uh, obtain a sword or whatever in Minecraft. I don't play an AI says, all right, look, right now you see that square box in front of you. Go over there, jump on that and and do whatever, which is interesting, right? Especially if you're looking at like from business central capability, maybe it might be able to say, hey, if you say, hey, I need to create a sales order, you could say, all right, click file up there, do this, do that. Who knows? Um, but that's interesting. And then last but not least for AI Copilot or for AI Snack Time, is that there is a new AI tools directory um, that has been created by a company called AI Parabellum. And you can go on here and find all sorts of artificial intelligence tools, whether it's they're free or whether they're paid and apply them to your business and, and, and things you wanna do. So we'll include a, a chat with that in the, uh, or a link with that inside the uh, show notes and uh, you know, that's all I got for AI stack time. Uh, but I'll leave I'll leave it with this, and I know Ken hates it. It's coming. <laughs> it's going to change everything we do yeah, about everything the world. you it's gonna do. It's going to be involved in everything, yep. Nothing will be the same. <laughs> Nothing's going to be the same. Maybe it'll figure, figure out a way to regrow some hair <laughs> on the top of how, guys' heads. How would it not? Yeah. It can do know. anything, Michael. It yeah, can we'll do see. anything. We'll see. All right, so that brings us to the end. But before that, we got to talk about beer ratings. Now, Ken, if I had to guess for you, I'm going to say you're going to give this cocktail here a solid 63. Very good. Very good, Michael. My off? 65. Oh, I was close. Yeah. I was pretty close. I call it the Black and Berry Beer Cocktail. Black and Berry Beer um, Cocktail. Yeah. And, and I, I, I kind of uh, positioned it. It's, it's Actually, you mentioned 63. 63 is what we, we um, I don't know the exact date, but we previously drank uh, peanut butter milk stout. Also from the left hand. Wait. No, this oh, is this Four is Hands Brewing. Four Hands Brewing. Okay. <laughs> the left hand brewing company, Peanut Butter Milk Stout. I gave a 63. And uh, I think I might have mentioned this earlier. I like I like the combination of these two beers together much better than I like either of these two beers on their own. Nice. So the the sum is greater yeah. than <laughs> the parts. Yeah. Um, for me, yeah, I, the the Four Hands Brewing Chocolate Milk Stout on its own, not not too big of a fan. Um, Line and Kugels, Barry Weiss, I don't mind it at all. I put it, you know, up there with with Summer Shandy, not not as good, but together, um, you know, we had what the left hand, and now we've got four hands. So how about hand to God? I'm going to give it a 72. <laughs> there you go. Solid 72. I like it. I like it Which, a lot. Which, by the way, not too far off from your 74 that you gave to the peanut butter milk stout. 
Yeah, I like so, that beer. That was pretty good, actually. So kind of right there. So. All right, then, everybody. That brings us to a close. Um, oh, next next month. Ken, you want to mention uh, we get a special guest coming on? We do. Yep. We're kind of venturing a little bit outside of our typical lane here a little bit. Uh, and we have a guest uh, expected to join us here, uh, Rob Hallberg. Uh, he is a 25-year-plus veteran in the commercial lending industry. So he's a, uh, in the banking industry as a commercial lender. Um, and his focus over the last over the majority of his entire career, has been on lending to small and mid-market businesses, primarily manufacturing, distribution type organizations. So uh, a lot of the companies that Rob is out there selling to, or 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 right, ser- providing banking services to, they're business central users or. They're running some other ERP similar to Business Central. And this is kind of going to be like a look from a completely separate vantage point yeah. of how does he, as a, as a banker who's going out there and considering lending money to an organization, how does he look at or does he look at the ERP system that they're running, the technology that they're running, and what does he feel? If, does he ever have the uh, the um, the request to lend money to implement new technology or a new ERP system? And how does that compare to lending money for putting up a new building or a new manufacturing facility? Maybe we drum up some new business for him. <laughs> so, so yeah, we're excited to have again. It's going to be kind of like a um, a new look, kind of a different different feel someone who's not in the business central world on a daily basis but to get his get his per his feelings and perceptions on how he thinks about erp nice all right well with that everybody like the podcast wherever you see it share it tell your friends about it ken bye bye as we end today's podcast we want to give a big thank you to everyone who listens shares this podcast and leaves us reviews you've taken a good amount of your time out of your day and we truly appreciate it thanks again and uh, don't be afraid to email us at marketing at solsyst.com with your tips for the podcast, or maybe you'd even like to be a guest during an episode.